whole new me. All right. My name is Carol Glasser. I am a professor in the Department of Sociology and Corrections. I'm also the director of the Kessel Peace Institute here on campus. And I'm really excited and proud to be a part of both of these groups because together we put together something called the Social Justice Lecture Series. And with the Social Justice Lecture Series, we bring in a lot of wonderful events every single semester. And this semester, we're doing Transfer of Memory. So Transfer of Memory is an event that we've been able to partner with the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas to bring in. On the basement level, some of you might have already seen it, there is a photo exhibit that documents Holocaust survivors and liberators who are living in Minnesota. The portraits were taken by David Sherman, and he will be giving a talk next Wednesday about how that photography helped move him from thinking of his photography as his job to his art, so I encourage you to see that. There's a number of events associated with this. We have today's talk. We have that. If any of you are teachers in the K-12, you can contact me, and I will help you get set up with the teacher training that we have. And we also have a closing reception. There are flyers outside with the dates and times of all of those events. There are a number of people that I need to thank before we start this event, because it takes a lot of people to bring an event like this to campus. I want to thank the Departments of Sociology and Corrections, the Kessel Peace Institute, and the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas for being the primary sponsors of this. But I also need to thank a lot of other departments who pitched in with energy, time, and money so this can happen. The History Department, especially Dr. Kyle Ward, Library Services. If you have not seen it yet, the library has three wonderful displays. Um, with books about the Holocaust on the first floor, second floor, and basement level. The Sociology Club, who has tirelessly promoted the event, and I think is probably responsible for this amazing turnout. All the professors who have incorporated this into what they're teaching and what you're learning this semester. And all of the student volunteers who have come together to help make this possible. I would also like to thank especially the Department of Art they moved around their art exhibits in order to open up the gallery so that we could have this exhibit here today. Uh, there's a couple things that you might be interested in. Um, our speaker today will be selling his memoir after the event, and you can get that signed. Some of you also received witness to the Holocaust books as part of your class. He is willing to sign those too, so after the event, he will be outside to sign those. Those of you who didn't get a chance to sign in to the event, who are required to sign in for your class, can also sign in on the sign-in sheets after the event. So remember, please turn off your cell phones, and this event will end at 3.15. Right now, I want to introduce you to someone much more exciting than me, with many fewer announcements, uh, Susie Greenberg of the Jewish Community Relations Council. Good afternoon. So I'm Susie Greenberg, and together with Laura Zell, who's in the corner over there, we are the curators of the Transfer of Memory exhibit. Um, this exhibit is part of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas, like Carol said, known as the JCRC. Since Transfer of Memory's inception, we have had the incredible experience of traveling the exhibit to over 50 venues having been seen by over one and a half million viewers and generating over two and a half million media impressions. So we're really proud of this exhibit and excited that it's here. Um, we're really honored to have the exhibit at Minnesota State University Mankato and in particular wanna, wanna thank Carol Glasser as well as the Department of Sociology and Corrections and the Director of Social Studies Education, Kyle Ward for the dedication to Holocaust education and the time and effort in making this possible here. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of background about the exhibit. In early 2010, the JCRC received a call from David Sherman. He's the NBA photographer for the Minnesota Timberwolves. And he was interested in pursuing a project that would entail photographing and documenting Holocaust survivors in our community. As Holocaust education is one of the pillars of what the JCRC works in, this was an idea that quickly became a very passionate endeavor of ours. The idea of securing the stories of these incredible people who survived this time in our history was invaluable on many levels. 
Not only did we recognize the value of first person testimony and documenting personal accounts of the Holocaust, we also knew that we would successfully be transferring these memories to, our, to the next generations. So in the fall of 2010, we began asking for participants to be part of this project. Our initial thought was we would open a window of six months to take portraits and interview survivors. Our hope was to capture the important legacy of our Minnesota Holocaust survivors. So eight plus years later, the project has grown to include 53 survivors from children who fled their homeland with their families to escape the impending anti-Semitism that was looming to young adults who endured atrocities at multiple concentration camps. At one of the first photo shoots, I recall meeting a man who warmly welcomed us into his home. As we settled in, he brought out his scrapbook and showed us the patch that he as a Jew was required to wear on his clothing to identify himself, and his picture is downstairs. I distinctly remember fighting the lump in my throat as it became vividly clear to me what survival and freedom meant to someone like him. As our efforts to capture his image and his spirit came to a close that afternoon, he embraced me with the kind of hug that old friends give each other, and he told me that the secret to love and happiness is showing someone else that you care. Another friend of mine, also in the exhibit, had her youth stolen from her as she was moved between six different concentration camps, ultimately being liberated from Auschwitz. Yet she too believes that at the core of all people is good. I've heard her speak to many different audiences, telling her horrific story, and she always ends with the same message, that hate is a terrible thing, but that no one is born with hate in their heart. The importance of these individual stories is as valuable now as ever. They are critical reminders about existing and coexisting in grim conditions. It's imperative that their stories are transferred from this generation to the next, and the next after that. It's been my personal privilege to learn from these survivors and their messages of resilience, love, and the human spirit. So in addition to the honesty and willingness of the survivors to open up and share their stories, we're grateful to David Sherman, who beautifully photographed the exhibit participants and helped us see their lives in full color. And to Lily Chester, who has eloquently taken the words of the survivors and created meaningful stories to accompany the images. The visitors who see the portraits and read their stories are invited into a piece of history that is more tangible due to their contributions. Today we are fortunate to be hearing from one of the exhibit participants, Fred Amram. Fred, born in the fall of 1933, was a young child in Germany when hatred was indoctrinated into his country. In a minute we will hear him share his story of survivorship and how he came to the US attended a school where he was the only Jew and the only student who did not speak English, and how he eventually came to Minnesota, where he has worked as a writer, inventor, consultant, and professor of speech communications at the University of Minnesota. Fred has spoken before numerous audiences and has written several books and publications. Together with his wife, they've created an art exhibit entitled The Lest We Forget, which is based around his memoirs. In Fred's own words, People who are survivors do more than be survivors. It's not a career. I wrote, taught, raised a family, and had a full life, so I didn't have time to write about my life. I was too busy living it. I also didn't want to be known only as a survivor. Now, though, it feels more urgent to tell my story. Now I would like to introduce Cami Kotke, a student volunteer and history major, and she will bring Fred up. Hi everybody, Fred Amarin was born on September 19, 1933 in Nazi Germany. He escaped with his parents to New York City in November of 1939, and today he will tell us about some of this journey. What he may not talk about are some of his accomplishments. Mr. Amarin gra graduated from Syracuse University and received his master's degree from the University of Minnesota, where he later became a professor of speech communication in General College. After retiring from his successful career of research and teaching at the U of M, which included many public publications, and Mr. Amran dedicated himself more fully to his creative arts and education about the Holocaust. His accomplishments are too many, 
to detail briefly, but here are just a few. He published several books, including his memoir, We're in America Now. You can actually buy this book and get it signed by Fred at the end, just like everybody else mentioned. He has invented and sold and holds the pen for a backpack with movable straps. He and his wife Sandra collected and curated an exhibit of patents held by women. He served for a decade as director of, of the University of Minnesota anti-poverty programs and he was even co-president of the University of Minnesota's woman, women's hockey team. The list of Mr. Amron's accomplishments go on but I will stop here so we can get to his talk. It's my sincere pleasure to introduce to you all Mr. Fred Amaran. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. All that introduction. Half of what Susie Hmm? It's not, it is on. You're not hearing me, someone said. Oh, yeah. no? I hear it. <laughs> How are we doing now? There, someone's up there happy now. Okay. Um, half of what Susie said and half of what Cammy said about me and is not true. Uh, I'm not going to tell you though uh, which parts those are. Um, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to, there we go. I was going to start by talking about the uh, exhibit that's downstairs and I really encourage you to go see it but uh, everyone has already talked about the exhibit so saves me some time for other things. Um, uh, the primary reason for you to go to see that exhibit is because my picture is in it. And, <laughs> and it's a great picture. It's really good. When you talk about the Holocaust, you tend to talk about Auschwitz, the, the famous death camp, the icon of the Holocaust. You talk about barbed wire and you talk about six million Jews being killed, when you talk about the Holocaust, most of the time, um, you talk about starvation, you talk about hate and killing, uh, you talk about all kinds of terrible things. You talk about pictures like you're seeing now. Am I standing in the way of the picture? Um, What I want to talk about today is how we got there. We don't, we don't immediately come to Auschwitz. Hitler became chancellor on January 30th, 1933. Um, there's not going to be a test uh, to, at the end of this. However, it would be really cool if you could get, keep a timeline in your head for the next half hour or so, because I want to show how the Holocaust grows, how any genocide grows, how it becomes, uh, because we don't start with Auschwitz. Auschwitz wasn't built until 1941, and it didn't become fully functional until 1942. The death camps weren't important until much, much later. How did we get to the death camps? How did we get to the atrocities? So Hitler is born and in, in, uh, Hitler is, becomes chancellor in January of 1933. By April, uh, Hitler has already persuaded most German non-Jews to boycott Jewish-owned shops. And it's and that, that kind of thing that, that is happening throughout Germany. Hitler is suggesting uh, Jews are bad, Jews are the enemy, Jews are the reason we lost World War I. Uh, Jews are you know, all, any excuse, any uh, scapegoat. Um, 
by September of 1933, uh, 1933, a Jewish child is born in a Catholic infant's home. Now, why would a Jewish child be born in a Catholic infant's home? Because the Nazis had already closed the public hospital to Jewish women. And the Nazis had closed the Jewish hospital in Hanover, the town where I was born. And so there was an order of nuns in Hanover that said, we will accept Jewish women. This is the beginning of my story about upstanders, people who stood up, who said, we will try to fight the Nazis. So here is a Jewish mother with a Jewish baby that was born in, in a Catholic infant's home. And clearly the baby is me. You recognize me, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and at any time, as I show you pictures of me, you're welcome to say, ah, oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> and, and it is. Um, so here we are, 1933, and things are, all, are starting to go bad. But closing the hospital and boycotting stores is inconvenient. It's not the same as a death camp. How do we get to the death camps? How do we get to the atrocities? By, 19, seven, uh, nine, by 1935, in September, the Nuremberg Laws were passed. And in the Nuremberg Laws, Jews and non-Jews were forbidden uh, of ma marrying each other. That is, non-Jews could not marry uh, Jews. Um, all civil rights were taken away from, um, from Jews, including citizenship. That is, you couldn't vote. You were not a citizen. You couldn't work in the civil service. You couldn't be a school teacher in a public school. You couldn't be a professor in a public university. Um, you couldn't work at any public institution. And so it began, step by step. And people knew. People did know. We knew in the United States, and people, or we, I wasn't there. I wasn't here yet. But your parents, your grandparents knew and didn't do anything. And so we find uh, Hitler drives uh, Jews, uh, deprives Jews of citizenship rights and bans intermarriages. This in the Baltimore Sun, 1935. So the whole world knew about it, but the world didn't do anything about it. Stuff's going on and nobody cares, or almost nobody cares. Separation, that's how every genocide begins. There's them and there's us. There's the Jews versus the Aryans, the Hutus versus the Tutsis. There's the Bosnians versus the Serbs, the Armenians versus the Turks. There's them and there's us. And we have to know who them is. Them, in this case, is the Jews, who were made to wear a Jewish star, a yellow star. Now, I don't remember wearing a star on my chest, like the person in the picture. We had an armband in Hanover, but the armband nevertheless had the Star of David in yellow, and everybody knew that I was Jewish. As I talk today, I want you to think how you would, I want you to feel, not just think. I want you to feel, how would you feel if you went shopping at the mall, like this family? How would you feel 
if when you went shopping at the mall that everybody knew that you were different. You had a stigma. You were not like the others. You were separate. You were them, and they were us. Oh, I'm not cute, right? <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> I can't believe how cute. Now, I want you to see this boy here of, of what? Three, four, five perhaps, the, the bigger one, perhaps five. Still chubby, still well-dressed. All these bad things are happening. That is, I've lost my citizenship. And I have to wear the Star of David. And non-Jews are boycotting my father's shop. And so on and on and on. Stuff's happening. No death camps yet. No starvation. This kid is chubby and cute and healthy and well-dressed and obviously upper middle class. And this is Goetheplatz. Goetheplatz is a park that was at the end of our street. Uh, my mother took me to the park very often. Uh, she, my mother was a really good whistler and she would, and when she took me to the park, she whistled at the birds. And the birds would literally come back, come down, and whistle back at her. To this day, I believe that they were having conversations. So I loved Goetheplatz. I loved going to the park. It was a wonderful thing. And on the way to the park, we passed uh, an ice cream shop. And at the ice cream shop, I would stop and say, Mom, Mommy, can we go to, the, uh, to get ice cream on the way home? And she would always say the same thing. Yes, we can, if you're a good boy. And being a good boy meant uh, holding her hand when we crossed the street, right? So we went to the park, and one day, lo and behold, one of the benches said, Nua für Juden only for Jews. Well, when I was five, I thought that was really cool. I said, I have, get to have my own bench. Well, it wasn't totally my own bench, because there were other Jews living in Hanover. But we were clearly a minority, a small minority. And so it was almost my own bench. My mother was furious because she knew what it meant. Clearly, I didn't know what that sign meant, that is, only for Jews. I learned a week later what it meant when I saw Nua for Aria, only for Aryans, on all the other benches. It meant I got to have one bench, and they got all the others, whoever they are the Aryans. And those were the good days. Those were the good days. That is when we could still go to the park. Because a year later, Jews couldn't use the park at all. And several years later, the Jews went to the concentration camps and the death camps. But not yet. It happened step by step by step. And I want you to think, here and now, what if somewhere in Mankato, or in your hometown if it's not Mankato, what if suddenly the park had a bench that said, only for Muslims, only for African Americans? And all the others said, all the other benches said, only for white Christians. How would you feel? 
and more important, what would you do? What would you do? Because whatever you do would have, would take some risk. It's not an enormous risk yet. When the bench has said, nur für Juden, but there was a risk. What would you do? And I want you to explore that in your heart now. Think about that. Sometimes when I have the time, when we have smaller groups, I ask people to shout out, what would you do? And somebody said, I would put it on Facebook. Well, what the heck does that do? <laughs> My daughter said, I would, I would scratch it out. Well, there's a beginning. What would you do? Would you sit in the, on the Jewish bench? Would you change the signs and invite the Jews to sit on the Aryan bench? What would you do if this were in your, in your hometown? Because what you do matters. What you do, what do you do matters. Could something like that happen in the United States? Yes. And then one day, the trolley on our street had a new sign that I had never seen before. It said, for Juden verboten, to Jews forbidden. On Sundays, my paternal grandmother used to take me to the zoo on the trolley. And now I couldn't go to the zoo anymore. And I had been such a good boy. But I couldn't. And then on the way home from the park, we did stop for ice cream. Yes, we still, 1935, 1936, 37, we could afford to go to the ice cream store. Still the chubby little kid. And we went to the ice cream store. And we sat down at a little table. In those days, you didn't get ice cream on a stick. What, you got ice cream by sitting at a little table with ice cream chairs. And you were served a dish like the picture you saw with a wafer in the top. And I had determined that I would have chocolate ice cream. And my mother would order coffee ice cream. And the owner who knew us, because we went there often, came over to our table and said, I'm very sorry. We can't serve Jews any longer. And so it happened step by step by step, them and us. Could that happen in the United States? When I first came to America, this is what I saw. There were water fountains for them and us. At the bus station, there were waiting rooms outdoors for them. And the white waiting room was indoors. Them and us. But folks protested. Pro Folks said, no. Folks said, we won't allow this to happen. And now we all wait in the same waiting room. One of the ways of identifying them was to have Jews have an identity card. We had an identity card that was that only Jews got to carry. At the top it says Deutsche, Deutsches Reich, German Empire. At the bottom it says Kenkalte, identity card. And that big J in the middle is for Jude, Jew. And this is my mother's card. And 
On the left-hand side is her demographic information, uh, stuff like her maiden name and her birthplace and her birth date and stuff like that. And on the right is her picture. And all the identity cards I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of them, always have that same picture. That is, the pose looking just to hat one side, a half face, and then there are fingerprints. And an interesting thing happened in 1938. Suddenly, all Jews had to have a common middle name. And so, all Jewish women suddenly became Sarah. And my mother had to sign her name Sarah. Now, as it turned out, she never had a middle name before then. But suddenly she had one. And my grandmothers both became Sarah. And all the Jewish women I know knew became Sarah. And I became Israel. My father's middle name was Israel. And Uncle Max's middle name was Israel. And so this was a pejorative, a put down. All the women had to have the same name. And all the men had to have the same name. Now, if your name happened to be Sarah, you got to keep it, if your middle name was. But if you had a different one, if your middle name was Carol, or your middle name was Michael, then suddenly you became Sarah or Israel. And once we've identified them and us, then we can dehumanize them. We've already said they're not good. Now we can begin treating them like less than human. This is the synagogue at which I worshipped when I was a little boy. Synagogue in Hanover. You can see it's a beautiful building. It was built in 1860, just about the time when Germany really became a unified country, those of you who are historians. And I knew then, when I was a boy, that in 2018, I would be in Mankato talking at the university, and that you might not believe that I worshiped there. So I did a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> and on the 8th of November, on the 9th of November, 1938, Christina, crystal night, the night of broken glass, I watched the synagogue burn. I was on the balcony of our fourth floor uh, apartment. We lived in a five-story apartment building, and I was in the, on the fourth floor, and I watched my synagogue burn. I watched flames coming out the windows. I watched the dome collapsing. Kristallnacht, crystal night, the night of broken glass, when a thousand synagogues in Germany and Austria were burned, when 7,000 shops, Jewish-owned shops, were destroyed by vandals, by people on the street, permitted, encouraged even by the police and the Gestapo. November 9th, 1938, all on a sudden, a thousand synagogues were burned. 7,000 shops were broken into, looted. Shop owners taken to the street, beaten up. 
Do you see how we're coming from? First, the Jewish hospital is closed. Jewish women can't use the hospital. And then we boycott. And then, and then the benches are restricted. And so piece by piece, step by step, little by little, we get worse and worse. At each step of the way, the people could have said no. There were more people than Gestapo. There are more civilians than police. There was no reason why the stop couldn't have happened earlier. There were risks. People were arrested for protesting. But what if lots of people protested? What if? Some people think that this is when the Holocaust started, November 9th, 1938. That's historically wrong. Because it started with the little things way back when. But Kristallnacht was a turning point because now, after this, it became more risky to intercede. Now you might be shot right there. So the Jews were hauled out of their homes, out of their apartments, out of their shops, were forced to scrub the streets all on Kristallnacht. Sometimes with scrub the streets with their own toothbrushes. And here you see a scene like that where Jews are scrubbing the streets and people, non-Jews, are standing around. What are they doing? What are they doing? They're standing by. They're bystanders. What would you do? Because what you do matters. The difference between a bystander and an upstander. What would you do, really, truthfully? And I want you to examine that in your heart. Would you be one of those folks standing by? What lessons are the children in this picture learning? What you do matters. And it's not that folks didn't know, but in none of the other countries did people care. Here we see the Cincinnati Enquirer. Nazis burn property, loot stores of Jews. This is in the United States. Did the United States do anything? No. Don't want to get involved. Don't want to take the risk. Don't want to get my hands dirty. There are, at this moment, genocides all over the world. Today, 2018. Not only are you not doing enough, some of you are doing nothing, some don't even know about the genocide. What do you do? Because there's stuff going on right now. And you read the newspapers. You knew, know about all of the refugees, all of the people without citizenship, escaping, fearing death, fearing hunger, fearing torture, escaping to the United States? No. Trying to escape to Europe? Sometimes. And what are we doing? 
What are you doing to talk to your government? Do we care? And then after Kristallnacht, well, even a little before, the Gestapo would come to our house. The Gestapo came to our house um, regularly, but not just our house. They came to the homes of all Jews, searching. Sometimes they were searching for people, like looking for my father, who had a way of knowing and seemed most of the time to be hiding. One day they came, knock, 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 always that triple knock, Gestapo. And then they would say what they want. Radios. Do you have radios? Where are your radios? And here they stood with their gun, and I'm hiding behind my mother's skirt. And my mother said, we have only one radio. It's in the living room. And they searched the whole house, turned everything upside down. And indeed, we had only one radio, and they left with our radio. And they came back for other things. Knock, 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 for whatever. Jews will not have radios. We will come back to check. And then, on the 1st of September, 1939, Germany inv invaded Poland. Now, Germany had already made contact with, and, and the, had in, uh, invaded Austria in 1938. Germany had taken part of Czechoslovakia. But the British all along had said, we're going to draw the line. Don't go any further. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. And that's the official beginning of World War II. Keeping a calendar in your head, we started in 33. And little things, little things happened. Then in 1939, the war started officially. And the British started bombing across, uh, across Germany, mostly in the area that was close to England. And Hanover was close in the sense that it was only a few hundred miles instead of a thousand. Planes could do it easily. And they had said all along, we'll drop real bombs if you invade Poland. And lo and behold, they invaded Poland. And so now the British came over. They dropped bombs. And every night, sirens would go off, air raid sirens. And we ran down to the air raid shelter, that is, a room in the basement that was dank, damp, it was dark and cold. But it was comfortable in the sense that we all were hiding together. We were afraid. And then one day we came down to the air raid shelter and there was a new sign that hadn't been there before. It said, Juden verboten, Jews forbidden. And from then on, I got to watch the airplanes from my fourth floor window. I got to listen to this, the airplane motor the whistle of the bombs. I got to watch the fires in the, in the neighborhood as bombs exploded. That's a pretty big adventure for a kid. It's something you remember. Juden verboten. Jews couldn't share the air raid shelter. And then they started taking the men away. 
Remember that first picture I showed you with all those skeleton type men who were skinny, clearly starved? Here we see people behind barbed wire in slave labor. They're, build, they're in road construction. These are all Jewish men from Hanover. But they're not skeletons, are they? Not only do they look healthy, some of them look downright muscular. But it happens step by step by step, and pretty soon some of them will be skeletons, and some of them will be dead. We have here a dentist, a couple of merchants, an attorney, the man with the big hair in the upper right, that's my dad. Now that we've separated them and us, we've dehumanized them. Now, since we've all accepted that they're less than human, we can go in right to the atrocities. Now we can do the horrific things. And so now I take you to Auschwitz. And this is an entrance to one of the gas chambers. And this is the gas chamber. And it didn't have flowers then, but it's a memorial now. Jews were pushed into there after their clothing had been removed. And the showers were turned on, except that they weren't showers. They were poison gas. And then, you see there's a door at the far end. The door leads to the crematorium, where the dead bodies were simply burned. All that was left was ashes and smoke. This is the kind of picture you expect to see when you think about the Holocaust, when you think about a genocide. But it takes a while to get here. And oh, by the way, this isn't the Holocaust at all. This is Rwanda. How can you tell the Rwanda genocide from the Holocaust? only from the color of the skin. This is Rwanda. This is the Holocaust. This is Bag and Belson. This is a concentration camp, death camp, not far from maybe 15 minutes bus ride from, from my home in Hanover. When the British first liberated this camp in April of 1945, they found 13,000 bodies littering the streets. Not, not buried, not in ditches, not burned. People were dying so fast that the Nazis couldn't bury them fast enough. This is the camp where Anne Frank and her mother died. You've read the Anne Frank book, probably. We talk about six million. Six million is just a number. And it has no meaning to us. It's just a mass. What can you do with six million? So I want to introduce you before we go, to some of the six million. We have here my, uh, well, my mother was the oldest of three girls. This is the middle sister, Carola, Carol. Born in 1911, died in January of 1945 in the Riga ghetto. And to me, this is doubly sad. It's 
doubly sad in that it's sad that my cousin, my aunt, that my aunt died in the Holocaust. But just three months before the Riga ghetto was liberated, if only she could have held on three more months, I would have had an aunt. And this is my paternal grandmother, the one who used to take me to the zoo on Sundays. Yetta Amram. Yetta is a variation on, on Het, uh, Henrietta. Born in 1871. On the 1st of December, 1941, a cattle car with 100 Jews left Hanover on the way to the Rio ghetto, the Rio ghetto. I don't know how long it took the cattle car to get to the ghetto, but my grandmother either died on the train or shortly thereafter. I shouldn't say she died. She was murdered. This was not a natural death. She was 70 years old. My mother was the oldest of three girls. The youngest was Kate, Kate, who married a man from Holland, from Amsterdam. And, uh, and she had a baby. And I met the baby once, Altje. Cousin Altje, my first cousin, my only first cousin. Cousin Altje was born 21st of August, 1939. She died in Auschwitz. She died in Auschwitz. In the gas chamber, in that gas chamber that I showed you. February of 1943. She was three and a half. So what's the takeaway? Takeaway is a call to action. See, see how the people in transfer of memory in the exhibit downstairs, see how they were saved. See why they're survivors. But that's just your beginning. Let that be motivation for you to move on. Have you had an enough moment? What's an enough moment? An enough moment is when you say, I've had enough. I'm going to do something about it. And if you haven't had an enough moment yet, let my cousin Alja be your enough moment. Because as I said, cousin Alja went into that gas chamber. Her little body was cremated in that crematorium. And though all that was left of her was ashes and smoke, and all I have left is this photograph. Maybe that can be your enough moment but it looks as if you're old enough maybe to have had some real ones of your own. We say that knowledge is power. Well, I tell you knowledge is not power. Knowledge plus action is power. Knowledge plus action is power. What you do matters. And if you're going to be a bystander, we here in Mankato could go the way of Hanover. Because it just happens step by step by step. And what steps are we on now? 
Well, I'm going to have to quit pretty soon. There will be a question in time, uh, I'm told. Um, if your question doesn't get answered, I welcome you to contact me. I, I welcome emails. Uh, you can, there's a contact page on my wonderful website, uh, www.fredamram.com. That's easy. Um, there is a book that they're going to sell in back, I'm told, and I'd be honored to sign any that you would like. All I ask of you is that you not be bystanders. That, that you not wait until you're done with college. That you vow starting tomorrow. No, that you vow starting right now to be an upstander. Because what you do matters. Thanks. Now we have time for question and answer. We'll have a microphone over here and one over here. So just go ahead and raise your hand and we have 15 minutes for question and answer if anyone has a question. It's always hard being first. There's one in the middle. So uh, since you, oh geez. <laughs> Since you have um, all this negative experience uh, from when you were in Germany, like lived in Germany, uh, do you still speak any of the German or, or any German? Or? Can you speak? Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, do you still speak any German since you've had all the negative experience? Yeah, some wonderful woman just came to me who had been in Germany, whose family had saved some Jews, a non-Jewish woman, and we just talked German. I even told her a German joke. Uh, that I can't tell you because it's sexist. <laughs> uh, but yes, I can still speak some German. It's so-so. Uh, she said I speak very good German. <laughs> Thank you. Dankeschön. Uh, others? Something really embarrassing and personal. microphone is passing. Oh, uh, question I have for you is just with the power, oh, over here. <laughs> over there. Right. Over there. Right over here. There you are. Hello. We are gathered here. Um, <laughs> dearly beloved. Um, anyways, the question I have for you is just with the connection and a lot of the motions that surround the different places where you grew up at a young age, what is it? What is it like going back there? That's a, a scary question because it, it deals with some feelings that are hard. Uh, going back is very complicated because one, there are memories. And the memories that come back that I had repressed. Repression isn't all bad, those of you who are psychology majors, uh, there are some repressed memories that come back and, 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 and that hurts. Um, uh, I must add that I still have nightmares. Uh, I have a whole chapter in, in, in my book about a, ni a recurring nightmare that I have where the Gestapo in the form of cockroaches come to my head. Um, Another is a happy feeling in that there are a lot of young people uh, that I meet when I go back to Germany 
who, um, who are really embarrassed by what their grandparents did. Um, we're talking about your grandparents, uh, or even your great-grandparents. You know, I am probably the age of your great-grandfather. Um, and they're embarrassed. And there's a new, there's a new culture. And uh, Chancellor Merkel, the, the chancellor, the current chancellor of Germany, um, is the most welcoming of refugees of all the European nations. Uh, you've read uh, all kinds of African and, and Middle Eastern refugees are trying desperately to get into Europe. Um, I went back, there's, there's another chapter in the book about my going back in 1960. And I was in Munich. I went to the Hofboy House. Uh, those of you, most of you haven't been there. It's probably the best beer drinking hall in the Western world. And you can tell that I have had a beer or two. Um, and there I met someone from the Hitler Jugend. The Hitler Jugend was kind of like Boy Scouts, only they were political scouts. And they learned to, to hate Jews, and they learned discipline, and they learned to be for the fatherland. And, and he didn't know, I didn't tell him that I was, um, that I was Jewish. And at that time, 1960, my German was still flawless. And, 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 and we talked, drank beer together, and he told me about his experience and what he had done with some pride, what he had done to Jews. Um, and, and I asked him, why he joined the Hitler Jugend. At the time he was probably, at the time that he had joined the Hitler Jugend, he was just a bit younger than you. And I said, why did you join the Hitler Jugend, the Hitler Youth? And he said, because they gave me a motorcycle. And then, and then, he told me how he got to dislike the Hitler Jugend because as the war started going badly for the Germans, um, he had to fight in the war. They used young people before they were old enough for the army to, to do other tasks in the, in the war. And he said he hated that and he was terrified. And I said, why did you stay in the Hitler Jugend? And he said, because they let me keep the motorcycle. And then I asked people like you, what would it take to have you join the Hitler Youth? Would a motorcycle do it to get you to hate Jews or Muslims or, or black folks? Or and then, so there are those feelings that I talked to people who were there and who picked on me, that is, my people. And on the other hand, I find young people who are embarrassed by what happened. So it's a very complicated feeling going back to Germany. It really, really is. You're, you'll have to invite me back next year because there's a talk I give about forgiveness and reconciliation and how one can deal with those feelings. It's an important question. I'd love to. Yes, up front. I just wanted to say that my great-grandfather was born in Hanover and migrated to this country, and I currently live on the farm that he homesteaded. We were fortunate enough some years back, maybe 10, to visit Germany and found his church and his home and uh, visited the country. My son was in the Air Force there. And uh, 
I was really impressed with the country. The cleanliness, the people, the friendliness, um, very impressive. And I'd go back there in a heartbeat. And then people say to me, apropos of that question, um, so if the country is so clean and people are so nice, what about the six million? How could that happen? And I think you have to incorporate that into this picture of German music, German culture, German literature, German art, and the six million, and the torture, and how gays were treated in, 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 during the Nazi era, and how, how all, any, anybody who was not an Aryan, a main run-of-the-mill white folks. We probably have time for one or two more questions. I know you're going to rush out, so I'm going to give you two announcements. Um, please know the curators, Susan, Susie Greenberg and Lauren Zell, are going to be at the art exhibit after this for about an hour if you want to walk through it with them. So that's in the basement of, the CIA, of this building, on, in the basement level, in the student art gallery, which is on the opposite end. And, and I'm going to be just outside the hall uh, so I can sign books and, and greet you. And a final announcement is we are working with the JCRC to get seats on a plane that will do a one-day trip to the Holocaust Museum for high school and college students only. There's brochures and flyers outside. It does cost money, so if any of you aren't students and would like to help send a student, feel free to email me at peace, the word peace, we're talking about peace today, at mnsu.edu. Do we have any... Is a question? I have one. Um, so, over this way. Oh. So, you mentioned sharing a, a, a beer with... I don't oh. know where you are. There you are. You mentioned sharing a beer with an oppressor, uh, someone who had, had I, done I, some I, evil things to people that you cared about. Um, how do you deal with that in, like, day-to-day -day life? Because I imagine that it, it wasn't just in that situation that you felt that, that, like... When you feel that hate or you see that in public, how is it that you address that? I have made it... Let me generalize that. Whenever I hear hate against any, anybody, um, I have made it my mission to be an upstander. Uh, I do what I can in politics, uh, or I did what I could do. I'm kind of old now, and there isn't much more that I can do. But I used to be very active in politics. I used to have my share of holding picket signs and going on marches and stuff like that. Um, I am currently, and, and I speak to student groups once a week at least, if not more, um, I recommend um, that you go to a website called World Without Genocide, and there there will be a list of things that you could do. Uh, I'm on the board of World Without Genocide, and, and we really try to fight to fight um, genocide, hate, everywhere we can. Um, I'm, I'm too old to be angry at every slight. I'm too old to be angry about anything much anymore. But I can still work. And that's what I want you to do. Because it might be a good note to end on. Because what you do matters. Thank you.